Uh, so I went to Georgetown University uh, in the late 90s, and apparently I learned to be in the right place at the right time. So Georgetown is, if anybody doesn't know the U.S., Georgetown is in Washington, D.C., and it's uh, kind of in the mid-Atlantic uh, region, south of New Jersey, but north of the Carolinas. Um, beautiful campus, gorgeous place. I'm really happy to have been there. And all four years, I worked at the main library circulation desk. So if you want to go check out a book at the main library, you would go here, and I might be the person to check the book out to you. Um, uh, I think uh, by the time four years is over, everyone at one point has been in the campus, so I felt like I knew almost everybody eventually. You see all the same faces, and you see every face. And um, the thing about the circulation desk is that uh, Every routine it is, is identical. It was so, it got boring to me right away. I got, I got a job my freshman year, and I ended up working there for all four years. Um, so it was my kind of, we call it work study in the US, you know, the job you do while you're on campus. And uh, by the time I was in my senior year, my fourth year, I had been, I had worked my way up the ranks uh, of, the <laughs> of the library, and I was a supervisor, but they had a special word for the student supervisors called super student. So I was a, so I was a super student, and um, and I, I took it upon myself to do as little work as I possibly could. I would um, sometimes I would be out front where the work was supposed to be done, but most of the time I would be in the back or just walking around the library, visiting friends and things like that. I uh, shooting you know uh, elastic bands at people and just spitballs <laughs> and stuff like that. But I was notorious for never actually being out in the work area where I was supposed to be. Of course, while the, the actual serious employees were there, I would always hover around. But as soon as they went home, I would just do whatever I felt like doing. <coughs> so the thing about the circulation desk that's important is that, like I said, it's, it's boring. And part of the routine is the reason why it's um, Every interaction is 100% identical. There's a, a line that you stand in, and it kind of snakes around at the front, and the students are holding their books that they've got on the different floors of the library. And then when they get up to you, they hand you their ID, okay? They hand you their ID, you take the ID, and then you flip it over, and there's like a little supermarket scanner type of thing. It makes like a beep, like a pleasant beep like that. Their record comes up on the screen. You press a button. Nowadays, it's probably even more updated, but it felt very futuristic in the 90s. And then a, a receipt prints out for each book, and you take that receipt and you put it in the back of the book of each one, and then you hand it to them and you say, "Do in two weeks." I can't, just saying it now. How many times have I said "Do in two weeks"? And you just hand the stack of the books, and then you see them uh, a week later when they're returning the books. So one day, I am uh, hanging out at the library. It's about the library closed at 10 p.m., so it was 9:45. And I wouldn't have remembered the specific time except for this story. So it was 9.45, and I was not where I usually am. At 9.45, I would be in the break room, and bathroom, anywhere but in the front. But for some reason, I was on the front desk. There were two other people working, ready to receive customers, and I'm kind of just standing off to the side. I don't know what I was doing. And the double doors in front of us open, and this guy walks in, okay? The first thing about this guy that was a little bit strange was that he was much older than the normal students that would be coming into the library. I, I, everybody in the library is late teens, early 20s at, at most. He's clearly in his 50s, okay? And he, I can picture him right now, he had like a, like a bewildered look. That's the best way you can describe it. Like he had just woken up. You know, like sometimes the hair is up on one side and something. He had a suit on, but it was not ironed, and it was just like slightly off. You know, and I was just, I remember turning to my friend Rachel, who was working with me that night, and saying, oh my god, look at this guy, he's a mess, you know? <laughs> and he just kind of just wanders into the uh, library, and he's holding in his hand, um, even for the 90s, this was dated, uh, he, a, a piece of paper that was like, remember I, old IBM printers had those printouts with like the w green and white stripes horizontal, and with the perforations on the side? So he's holding this, which just makes it even more anachronistic. <laughs> it's like, what, what time machine did this guy just come from? <laughs> and then the worst part of it is that he walks right up to me, and you know, like, I'm kind of like with my eyes, kind of like guiding him over <laughs> to where the work is supposed to be done. How dare you ask me to do anything? And um, and he is like, uh, can you help me? And I was like, 
okay, sure, reluctantly. And he says, um, I have a bunch of books here that I need. Can you go get them for me? And you know, part of being working in the libraries, you learn how to be a library snob. You know, all the librarians are kind of a little bit snotty like that. You know, so I said, "Sir, this is not the Library of Congress where they go get your books for you. You know, you have to, you have to go get them yourself. And if you bring them down here, I can help you check them out." And then he said to me, "I'll make it worth your while." So I said, "Okay." So I took his list. <laughs> Actually, you know, looking back at it, I have no idea why I, I took his list. It's not something that I normally would have done, but I think what it is is just the routine was so numbing for years that, that I, any break in routine, it's like Groundhog Day, kind of like any break in routine is a welcome thing. So the fact that something different was happening, whether for better or worse, I just felt like I, I should do it. So I, I took this list, and since we were closing, I just um, went in the back and I put it, every worker had their own little cubby hole, like a little mail slot, so I just took this thing and I put it in the mail slot. So I worked Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, all day. Monday came by, Tuesday came by. I never really went to the cubby hole unless it was for my paycheck, you know, so I didn't even check it. So I remember going in on Friday. Oh, oh one more detail. The guy said, I'll come back in a week to pick up my books. Okay, fine. So a week later, Friday, I'm going, I just glance at my cubby hole and I see this list sticking out of there. So, oh God, I forgot to get that guy his books. So I took the list out of my mailbox and I went and I started looking and um, I started looking up some of the books online and I noticed that half the books weren't in our library. We didn't have them, which is a strange thing to come into the library with a list like that anyway, because usually people have looked it up on like our library catalog or something like that. Okay, so that's a bit odd. There were 18 books on the list, so nine of them weren't even there. And then I just started to look through them. Our library is quite big. If anyone's been to Georgetown, it's quite, quite a big library. But I walked around, it took me about a half an hour. And in the end, I ended up finding three, three of his 18 books, okay? So I was like, okay, whatever. So I just took the books and I put them kind of under the counter. I didn't even really think about it. So the day goes on, uh, eight, uh, eight o'clock goes on, eight o'clock comes. He said, oh, by the way, he said he would come right at 8.30. So eight o'clock comes, 8.30 comes. 9 o'clock comes, 9.30, whatever. I remember thinking to myself, okay, that guy was weird anyway. I'm sure he's not coming. 9.55, so it was five minutes before we close. And Rachel and I had started to close up everything around the um, desk. You know, the lights were half off and stuff like that. And the double doors open and, this, and the guy comes in. I mean, identical outfit. I don't know if he changed clothes in the past week or what, but he <laughs> exactly the same. The bed head, everything was identical. And he came right up to me and he said, uh, do you have those books that I wanted? And I said, oh yeah, I'm surprised to see you here. Um, I said, yeah, I, I looked for the books, but the funny thing was that we only had three of the 18 books that you wanted. Uh, and the weird thing, this is when I, know, I felt like something was odd right here because he didn't seem to care about that fact. If you had come in with a special list of 18 books that you needed, and, and only three of them were available. He's like, yeah, oh, whatever, you know? Like, okay, that's a bit of a strange reaction. I was like, so would you like to check them out? And he said, yeah, okay. So then we kind of move over to the side where the checkout thing was. And so the way it works at the circulation desk is, remember I was saying everybody has to present their ID? It's like they, they, just, they just do that. We have, at Georgetown, we had three colors of IDs, red for students, blue for staff, and yellow for faculty. So it's a sea of red, and then every once in a while, a blue and yellow one randomly. This guy pulls out an ID, a, a shade of color I have never seen before. It's like not even part of the color wheel, you know? It was like grayish green. And I remember looking at this thing and thinking, what? You know? Remember, by then, after four years, thousands, maybe 10,000 IDs or something at that point. I was like, you're a student here? Like, I see the emblem of the school on there, and I'll never forget. I mean, some things, some things, some things you don't forget. I remember the picture not being like perfectly aligned with the ID, just like two degrees off, you know, and I'm thinking, you're a student here? I said, yeah. And I was like, okay, all right, I've never really seen this. So I flip it over and there's always that beep, you know, you just see the barcode on the back, back uh, no beep. So like you do it and you know, now I feel like I, I, I have sympathy with the supermarket scanner who's like panicking when they're trying to beep. But just like the scanners, we also have a second system to do it, you know. So uh, on the back, I could still read the barcode even though the scanner wasn't reading it. So I, I punched in the barcode. And what happens when that happens is that the student's record fully comes up. It says no record found. So that had never happened to me. 
the entire time that I'm working there. Every once in a while, a student smears something on their barcode and you can't beep it and you have to type it in, but it always fully comes up. So I asked him again, you're a student here? He said, yeah. So there is one, of the nuclear option, there is one other way where you can get a student's uh, I, uh, profile up on the screen is you can put their name in it. Now, uh, the, only, the only reason I know that is because sometimes if I was interested in some, knowing more about somebody, I would put in their name. <laughs> You read Russian literature? I read Russian, Russian literature. What, what are the chances of that? No, you know, so you find out what people are reading and all the, the home address. Okay, whatever. I won't, get into all the, <laughs> I won't get into all the things that are on there. But yes, you can go in with their name. So um, you're not supposed to do this very often, but I'm a super student, so I, I could do it. So I put in my special login so that I can do that. And I flip the card over and I put in his last name and I see there's a record and then I look, I click on it. And then there is a record for this guy, but it has Oh, it appears in a way I've never seen it before. It had just his name, just his on-campus address, and then nothing. No past history, no record, no status or anything like that. And I didn't, I didn't even know what would happen if I tried to check out the books, because usually it's kind of like verifies that this person is allowed to take out books. Yeah. So I was like, okay. Uh, and then I just turned it over, and the book scanned perfectly fine. It printed out a receipt, and, and it was, they were doing two weeks, but I just like handed the books to the guy like, I don't know what I don't know what is going on with you, but good luck to you. See you, see you, see you never, you know. And um, <laughs> and he takes the books and he looks at me and he says, "Okay, so what he says is so clear to me that it's like he said it ten minutes ago." Okay, he said, "Would you help me carry the books out to my car?" Which is a very strange thing to say for many many reasons. The first reason is he has two arms, he's not carrying anything, he's not, and he's also big, this guy's big, like I'm short, he's maybe 6'2 or 6'3, okay? Why does he need me to carry the books out to his car? It's just a strange request, right, on his face, you know? I don't know, I, he had like mesmerized me or something like that. I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I will carry the books out to your car. And I remember Rachel, she had been working with me for three years at this point. I remember looking at me like, what, are you crazy? I was like, I'll be back, I think. <laughs> and I, and, and I, I just like kind of, I, I, I remember walking out of the library and thinking like, what am I doing? Where am I going? Whatever. So anyway, as we were walking, I said, where's your car? And, and uh, now if anybody wanted to come into the library very quickly like he was doing, especially like late, right at closing hours, you would park at the front gates. This is 37th and O Street. If anybody knows Washington, D.C. at all, there's like a very elaborate front Gothic gate at Georgetown University, and you would pull up your car illegally there, but just for five minutes while you run in to, to get your books and come right back out. That's the logical place because it's only 200 feet from the door of the library. I said to him, oh, where are you parked? And he said, oh, down here on N Street. Now, if you, right when you come out of the library, instead of going straight towards the elegant gate, you can take a very dark and strange staircase that no one ever really took that's directly to the right of the library that's not lit, and it just goes straight down to like a series of roads, Reservoir Road and some other roads that are completely unlit at night. You would not, it would not make sense to park there, okay? So I said, oh, you parked down there? And he said, yeah. I said, oh, okay. So, so then, I'm walking down the steps. Now, we're walking down the steps together. And then at one point, as we're walking, because it's about maybe 24 steps, three sets of eight, something like that. When we're walking down the steps, I distinctly remember at one point, he, I've now, I'm now walking on my own, and he's walking behind me. You, know, you can, feel, you can you see someone out of your peripheral vision on your side, and then you don't see them anymore. And then he's big, so his steps are loud. So he, for every like one step of his, like little, two little steps of mine, you know? And I'm like, why is he walking behind me? So then we get to the bottom of the steps and I was like, okay, we're at the bottom of the steps, whatever. And I said, I'm looking around, there's no cars here. So I said, where's your car? And he said, oh, it's just up the road a little bit. Like, okay, you know, he didn't say the car was up the road. He said, it's just down these stairs. Okay, so I was like, really? And I'm looking up ahead, I don't see any cars. And he says, oh, just like one and a half blocks ahead. I mean, okay, so we're walking. And the, the university is just, you know, a minute behind me, but it feels like it might as well be an hour back there. It's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and we're just walking. It's kind of like just marching. I'm walking in front of him. He's behind me. 
I'm like, where is this car? You know, so after a, a block and a half, and there's no one around, by the way, 10 o'clock at night on a, like a weekday, uh, we finally come and there's a car. I see a car in the distance. We kind of come over this little hill and then there's a car. And it's like a big Lincoln Town car, okay? And we reach the car and I'm like, thank God there's a car here. Like at first, <laughs> at first you're not sure that there was a car, kind of like, a, like in the desert, you see a mirage, and I'm like, is that a real car? I think I touched it to make sure it was real. Um, and I said, okay, here we are. Here's the, here are your books. And then I'm telling you word for word, he said this to me, there are some things in life that you just do not forget. He turns to me and he says, would you crawl in the back seat and place the books in the car? <laughs> now, given all of the other things that he said, it's not particularly strange. <laughs> But what's stranger is, what do you think I said? Yes. Yes. Yes, I will do that. <laughs> I don't know why. I think part of me was thinking, I had come this far. I'm just going to finish this. Whatever this thing is, I just want, <laughs> I just want to take it to its logical extent. And uh, he opened the door. And I, I, I got on like all fours, as you do, kind of in that type of situation. And I, I placed the... <laughs> the books on the seat, and I remember distinctly tilting my head up and looking out the window of the back seat of the, you know, the car, the wheels on the other side in the US, so it was behind the driver's side, looking out the back window there, and looking at this little street lamp and, and thinking that this stupid street lamp is going to be the last thing that I see in my life. Something has to be the last thing that we see, right? So I was like, I never thought it would be this ridiculous street lamp. And then I like put the books down and I think I even like just waited like a second, you know? <laughs> I'm, like looking, nothing happens and then so you just kind of like awkwardly crawl back out of the thing and then I stood up and I was like, okay? And he says, uh, yep. And then he said, all right, see ya. And then I, I, I turned and started walking as fast as I could back to the library and I got about, I got about 10 feet and he says, wait. And I turned around, okay? And he said, uh, I think I said I would make this worth your while. And I said, no, 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 it's perfectly fine. I, I, good luck to you. No, no need. And he said, no, 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 come here. So I, uh, I went over to where he was, and I stood standing right in front of him, and he pulls out his wallet slowly, and he uh, takes out a $100 bill, okay? And he hands it to me. He says, here, this is yours. He says, you know, I'm a graduate student at this library, and nobody ever helps me here. It's like. Nobody ever takes any time to go get my books or anything like that. I'm so busy, I can't really, I don't have time to do it, but it's really nice of you, man, to go get those books for me. Okay, so I took that, put it in my pocket. And then he took out a business card, and he was a vice president at Merrill Lynch Bank in, uh, in Washington. And he said, if you ever need a job, listen, people call my office for jobs all the time. If you ever need a job, don't let my secretary stop you. Just send, send the call, have her send the call directly to me, and, and you can have it, you know. So this was before the financial collapse, so that was very, that was a very that was a, I should have probably taken him up on that offer, but I think I was just so happy to be alive that I just took the card and I put it in my pocket and then I turned around and said, see you later. And I walked back to the library. So it had been like, man, I'd only been maybe 10 minutes, but it felt like I was gone for an hour. And I, by the time I got back to the library, Rachel was like, what was that? You know, so I told her. I said, yeah, I told her about how we had to walk so far, and then I told her about this question making me crawl in there and everything. And she, her mouth is just totally open. And then at the end, I told her, of course, that I got this $100 tip. Uh, and she was furious. She said, you don't do any work around here. You're not even in the front. You're never even in the front. And, you, and the only reason he even came up to you was because you were off to the side, and he couldn't be bothered to go to where I was standing. You know, she was right, actually. She, she was right. I hadn't done any work that night, and I hadn't done any work any previous night either. Um, but I guess one thing I learned at Georgetown was how to be in the right place at the right time. Thank you.